But see, I, I really appreciate you being here with me on the, the Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation Podcast and specifically here for our series on the impact of fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, for folks who are unfamiliar with, with you and the, the work that you do, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Thanks, Corey. I'm so pleased to be here on the podcast. I uh, can't wait to get started. I'm Lucy Shea. I am the group CEO of Futera. And I'm based in the UK, but Futera has offices in London, New York, Stockholm, Mexico. And we've got about 60 people. We've been going for about 20 years. So that's me. Wonderful. And, and if you wouldn't mind, so that we could uh, understand a bit more as, as to the angle which we're, we're coming to this context of speaking of fashion. Uh, and I know that, that y'all at Futera uh, have worked with uh, a few notable clients in the fashion industry, Tommy Hilfiger. I saw REI and as, as well, uh, perhaps Gap. But what, what is the core of the, the work that y'all do so that we can paint a picture as to, to how you're coming to the space of fashion? Right. So the core of Futera, at the moment, there's some things to follow, which I'll tell you about. <laughs> but the core of Futera's work at the moment is as a change agency. So we work with those big brands, some of which you mentioned, also some smaller brands such as Econel, and also um, big not-for-profits like the Loudest Foundation, which used to be the CLA Foundation in the fashion space, um, to make change happen. We put together the logic of sustainability, understanding where the brand or business or foundations really material issues sit, they're important issues, but then also apply the magic of creative, so whether that's coming up with a big idea that can sit at the heart of the brand or the business strategy or coming up with an amazing way of naming a platform or branding a new business venture or creating a website where everyone can swap things or whatever it may be. Mm. Um, that's what we do. We put magic and logic together to create change all in the pursuit of sustainable development. That is in our articles. We are legally bound uh, as a fellow B Corp member, we are legally bound to uh, create, to, to, to work towards sustainable development. Mm. Thank you for that. And, and maybe you wouldn't expect that, that this would be where we go first, but I know that, that fashion has inspired you personally for a lot of the work that you do. And that, that's uh, um, come to, to be shown in a lot of the initiatives be, you've been a part of through Futera and, and uh, outside of that. And so I, I would love to know, Lucy, uh, perhaps with the context that we're in in the world today, w why do you feel like fashion and the, the fashion industry are so important to focus on? Right. So exactly, because Futera as a business actually focuses on you know, many sectors, not just fashion, right. tech as mm -hmm. well, you know, Google as one of our clients and um, uh, food a lot as well. Um, I've always been particularly drawn to fashion because I think, as I'm sure other of your podcasts will cover, it's got some really big problems. It's got some really big issues socially, environmentally, um, how it makes people feel about themselves, how it drives um, not helpful behaviours in terms of overconsumption not being particularly good about yourself, um, how do you look in a piece of clothing, etc. cetera, um, let alone living wage, uh, mm. pollution. You know, so the list of issues with fashion is endless. Um, and improving somewhat in industry, but not fast enough. However, I found myself working particularly in this area of sustainability because I love fashion. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear up, but I fucking love fashion. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and before I found myself working in sustainability, that was much more of how I identified. I, you know, I mm. read Vogue. I spent a lot of my time thinking about what to wear and how to style myself. Um, you know, I, I have an older sister who I looked up to quite a lot. I was like, hair is really stylish and how can I be like her? And so when I came to work in sustainability, which... You know, it's not like I just fell into it. There was a huge driver for that as well, particularly around social justice, which kind of the original mm -hmm. reason I found myself in this space. Um, I felt uh, guilty and like that 
I couldn't reconcile um, where I was working, my professional mm. life, and kind of how I felt as a person, my personal life. So I thought, well, got to do something about this. <laughs> so um, that's when I first worked, with Futera worked with a couple of organisations to set up um, the UK, I think actually the, the world first sustainable fashion awards, um, the ethical fashion awards. It's why we started Swifting, uh, which is the glamorous clothes recycling parties. And it's why I joined forces with the amazing team with Fashion Revolution to help that get off the ground. And it's why ultimately we've ended up working with so many of the, you know, leaders uh, in this field. Um, because, yes, it's got all these issues, but it's a huge employer of women mm. in particular all around the world. And it is one of the makers of manners. Uh, fashion sets the agenda. Fashion sets style. Fashion can make sustainability fashionable. And this is kind of... Mm. Not exactly a cliche, but something that people talk about a lot now. But when we were kind of starting out in this space, that wasn't spoken about. And in fact, when we were really starting out in this space, when Futera was a sustainability comms agency, the notion that you would use persuasion, behavior change, you know, sexiness in terms of clothes in order to sell sustainability was anathema. It was very controversial. We're not mm. there anymore, thank goodness. <laughs> um, so that's why... Fashion has a lot of problems to solve, but it's also a great change maker or potential change maker. Mm. I certainly uh, agree with you, and and that's been uh, well well uh, apparent in many of the interviews that we've had here in this series. Fashion is an extremely impactful industry, for better or for worse, uh, and that that's an interesting perspective that I haven't yet heard from the perspective of fashion then kind of being the, the leader for perhaps other items, you know, and other kind of uh, consumer goods in one way or another, mm -hmm. it, it starts to feel a bit more incongruent, I guess, if you're wearing, you know, items in, in garments that are made sustainably or represent perhaps what's sustainable fashion and then other things in your life aren't, you know, it, it, right. and fashion and clothes are things that we engage with every single day. Uh, <laughs> whether, uh, we, we, um, you know, mindfully think about that or not, but I really appreciate that, that perspective, Lucy, and, and speaking to sustainable fashion generally, this is something that is not defined so explicitly. And I, I think that while folks may have different angles and, and viewpoints as to what is sustainable fashion, going through the exercise of trying to define it and paint a picture, I think is pretty important and part of what we're doing here with this content. And so I'd love to hear uh, from your perspective, you know, what, what is something of the, the utopian vision or ideal for, for what sustainable fashion is to you in, in a sustainable fashion industry looks like? Great question. Um, and I couldn't agree more about that piece around the incongruency. Uh, marketeers have this thing called the corridor. That's why if you mm. get, you know, a new family onto organic baby food, you get, might actually be able to flip them onto organic food or choices right. or more sustainable choices elsewhere. Um, so, okay. Um, well, Definition of sustainable clothing. I might go there first. Um, I love to quote my friend Ursula de Castro here and say the most sustainable item is the one you already own, the one mm. that's already in your wardrobe. So keeping hold of your clothes, uh, loving them for longer, uh, not buying new um, is still probably the biggest impact you can have. Um, it doesn't necessarily speak, though, to where everyone is in their mm. life stage. You know, I think that's, how am I? I'm 43 now. I've got a lot of clothes. I've built up <laughs> a lot of clothes over my lifetime. It's, it's a little bit easier for me to do that than, you know, a young kid who's, you know, pandemic allowing, wanting to go out and wear something different and something new. Um, every Friday night or whatever night it is the kids go out on nowadays. <laughs> um, so there um, I am really a fan of even the kind of the big 
fast fashion brands who are trying to create perhaps still incremental but change at scale um so i think what we need to get to is that no matter who you are how you use fashion what you use it for uh, the impacts of it have been managed for you really mm. so if you want to wear a different dress top you know pantsuit uh every week um that those issues have been managed for you that they are within the circular system and that circular system has had a just transition so that folks within it have been looked after paid well empowered trained up able to you know read and write um send kids to uni all mm. that piece so i'm sorry that might be quite a simplistic answer it's just one way everything's fixed <laughs> <laughs> but i guess that would be my definition mm. That's interesting. I, I, I think, um, I guess in that, that definition, I'd love to hear if there, there's follow up on it. it. It seems as if from your perspective, you know, the, the consumption habits, they don't necessarily, I mean, if, if they didn't change, that would be okay. Provided that, uh, perhaps circularity is, is something that's already built into the system in the industry. Yeah, I do. I believe that quite strongly. Um, and it goes to, there's a, there's been a debate it's a bit less current now, but it's been a debate kind of ranging for a long time within the sustainability community that we need to change who people are. We need to change people's values. And there's some values are good and some values are bad. And the desire to consume is bad and you know, mm. should be punished. And I don't believe that. I, I, I mean, I think there's an interesting uh, argument that says, can how, how can we make lower consumption behaviors higher status mm. um but that the desire to consume is not necessarily bad it's the impacts of consumption we have a problem with i mean wanting to look good and wear something nice is it's okay that's kind of how we're evolutionary programmed so and also i don't think we've got the time in the window of change that we have to avoid climate change and to you know as quickly as mm. possible make the system more equitable um, you know, it, it, that's, that's a big, I'm not saying we don't need big systems change, but that's a big values change. I think it's going to take us too long to get to if, if mm. ever it's possible. So I think changing the system so that the impacts of our desires are managed is, um, a more, slightly more respectful and probably more possible way of getting to where we need to get to. Mm. Yeah. The, it, and there's a balance between the, the focus and prioritization of individual action, as opposed to looking maybe where are the largest levers of change. Um, sure. and so probably looking at the buckets of where the greatest impact is made, uh, as opposed to, you know, if someone was to reverse and change their habits extremely, not to say that people shouldn't be considering these, these things and yeah. in aware in a to those, um, there could be a lot much greater change made if we're looking at an H and M and how they produce clothing and, and the supply chain and, and how that affects people and the planet along with it. Um, and so Lucy, we've mentioned a few perhaps points of resistance and, and barriers. Um, at the top, you said we're not moving fast enough to this, this world of sustainable fashion. Uh, what, what is your assessment of the progress? for us like what what kind of pace do you feel like we're on um okay so i think there's been an enormous amount of change if i think back to um pre rana plaza that obviously a terrible tragedy of which there yeah. have been many other tragedies and there have been many since um but that was one i think partly because of the fashion revolution um but for other drivers as well that really um hit home for the industry mm. so i think since then we've seen enormous change um, you know, the number of packs and, um, you know, collaborations and um, net zero commitments and um, some progress on living wage. Um, and the consumer has, I mean, transformed um, over the last, particularly last five years or so. And consumers are research at Futera around the honest generation and honest product shows that particularly Gen Z are 
do not feel that brands are being honest with them and are not content with kind of big brand purpose and statements. They want to see change, they want to see change at product level, they want to see information at product level. They want to know, you know, not how you as a business are doing, but how am I doing? And therefore, what is it, what the product that I'm buying, does it help me lead a more sustainable lifestyle or, you know, um, be a better person, whatever it may be. Um, so I think, honestly, I feel fashion is still really struggling to be part of the solution. There's mm. been enormous change, but I don't really think you could point to any brand at scale and say, right, it's sorted, or that you can see the plan on how they're going to get there and it's going to be equitable and it's going to be circular. I mean, there's many that have put, I mean, you know, some of our clients included have put these, you know, great um, strategies and plans into place and, you know, you can see uh, Adidas end um, uh, plastic and their Pali shoe. You can see Tommy Hilfiger, one of our clients, with their enormous mission to um, welcome all and waste nothing and to create circular business models with Tommy for life. But in terms of where we need to get to, where consumer demand is, uh, we, we, we have a long way to go with the rest of the industry. Mm. And I'd love to see it move quicker. And I'd love to mm. see some of the marketing dollar that goes into promoting, and I know I said there's no problem with consumption, but still, <laughs> some of the marketing dollar that goes into promoting huge consumption and also lack of self-worth and self-esteem be repurposed into more sustainable forms of consumption, sustainable materials, um, take back, subscription, you know, it's all there. It mm. just needs to be uplifted, really. Mm. And then that's, that's as well a sentiment that's, that's reiterated. There's a lot of exciting things happening in fashion uh, and it, the, the drawback in those scenarios, in those contexts is it seems to be the smaller brands, uh, uh, first off who are, are leading the way, but what, what's holding us back from, from uplifting the, the sentiment of sustainability, uh, in those contexts of scale with those larger brands, like what, what are the largest barriers that are, are keeping us, uh, in this industry from, from moving as fast as we should? So, um, I've been involved in the, um, uh, United, the UNF C fashion charter, um, for a while now, um, on the steering committee and as part of the, uh, Commons working group. And so we've just had this huge consultation period, um, uh, led by the Comms Working Group um, and Rachel Arthur, uh, and asking that very question, actually. Mm. Um, you know, what we know what we need to get to, what's holding us back. One of the things that came up was fear, actually. Um, mm. Fear of doing it wrong, fear of there not being a business model, uh, fear of greenwash. Uh, we've got new guidance out on greenwash recently from uh, the UK Competition and Markets Authority. Um, fear of um, it costing more, and, and often it does actually in the short term. Mm. Um, fear of pandemic, stores closing. Um, so I, I think there's a there's a lot of fear around, um, and it, you know, if I was going to be uh, speak bluntly as well, I think that there there often is some very good comms put into this. I mean, mm. I, I know I do come from. A, change agencies so <laughs> might sound slightly self-serving, but a lot of the marketing or advertising or, you know, the sell that gets put around this is pretty poor from the mainstream mm. agencies and kind of small wonder because a lot of them are in the pockets of the fossil fuel companies and have, you know, a lot to gain from remaining part of the status quo and the kind of oil-based economy. So what would it change it? Ending the patriarchy? Um, <laughs> seeing some serious social change going on that gets the kind of uh, businesses and brands to really sit up and go, okay, this is where we now need to be putting our serious yeah. investment. Like what, what would, um, my colleague Solly talks about this, like invent your competitor. If you're there, you know, putting a little toehold into this market, but thinking about where to make a big bet and a big jump, get together with your board and think about who your, um, uh, you know, uh, sustainable competitor is. Who's your competitor that will still be here in another 10 or 15 years 
with mm. new pro products and services that are right for this new context that will meet these new audiences and what they desire. So, yeah, I think it needs some it needs some welling, as a Brit would say, <laughs> <laughs> some senior leadership. And what what brands at scale and and I know we've covered a, a couple of your clients already, but what brands do you see in fashion uh, at scale really like packing the the punch from a communication standpoint? Are there examples that that you think should be admired and and perhaps followed, or is, is it still pretty thin and, and sparse and just not there at all yet? So we've been looking at this um, with some intention recently at Peter and figuring out um, how, which brands are part, are, are becoming part of the solution, which brands mm. are actually both creating change, but also helping their consumers be part of the solution as well. And we found that there's a nifty little formula. Um, so rather than kind of saying, you know, here's my school card and some people are going to I'll say what we found is there's a, um, what we're calling you know, the known and trusted triangle. And the brands mm. that are doing really well, the business that are doing really well, are those that uh, marry a standout goal, um, so a big promise, something that will actually shift things, that if everyone adopted it, would kind of be partway there, mm. um, particularly if it's one of the first, you know, first of its kind, but marries that with a breakthrough activation because that brings consumers and also your entire employee base along with you. Mm. So um, I mentioned Addy earlier with their kind of end plastic waste. I mean, that's a good one. They've got a goal to um, get rid get rid of all, you, sorry, it's get rid of all virgin plastic, use the virgin plastic by 2022. And then they have their Pali collection, which is made with, um, you know, economic basically, so plastics um, from the ocean. Um, so that's good. Uh, again, I'd point to Tommy with their um, uh, Welcome All and Waste Nothing. I mentioned their Tommy for Life, which is their e-commerce platform. Uh, but also they have an amazing um, uh, range of adaptive clothing, which is designed for um, people of different abilities. Um, mm. And it's got a great personal story, like uh, Tommy's son um, has a, a different ability, basically. So it's really kind of come from who the brand is and what it's about. Um, but it means when you see the come, well, what do you mean by welcome all? You can actually shop the collection as well. It doesn't mm. need to be a collection. It could be a behavior change campaign. It could be an advocacy campaign. But I think those that put together a really breakthrough goal that will change things and then cleverly package that up with a, a, a piece of comms that consumers actually can see and partake in, then mm. the whole thing starts to come together. It's the magic and the logic, as we call it, Futera, but mm. the whole thing starts to really tell a story and can accelerate further change. Mm. And, and so, Lucy, I'm wondering, where where do you feel like there's the, the greatest need for catalyzing change in this ecosystem? Is it from, I mean, I know you work quite intimately with businesses in this space, but do you also see it as something legislative, you know, from the, the government uh, uh, regulatory side, consumers? I mean, I know everyone is involved <laughs> to some extent and has responsibility and accountability, but where do you see there needing to be the, the first kind of greatest driver? I, I think um, I, I only touched on it ever so briefly. I mentioned it earlier, but I think living wage needs addressing. Mm. Um, it's just not on. <laughs> it's not on that, um, you know, if you kind of go back to kind of where sustainability Start, you know, the, the idea that you would take um, responsibility for your supply chain and their, um, let's take it back to environment and their emissions was, you know, 10, 15, probably 20 years ago, anathema. Like, uh, what do you mean? I run my business and I shouldn't ask about what happens. You know, that's, that's my fellow entrepreneur's responsibility. Mm. And that we've moved to this, um, you know, we'll scope one, two, and three, that actually you do need to be responsible for your carbon emissions, both upstream and downstream. Uh, I think we need a similar framework, energy. Um, there's the Amazing Act um, initiative, uh, which is making change at a kind of country by country basis. Uh, but we need more of that. We need more brands to join Act and to participate with full energy. 
Uh, I was encouraged to see Promark put out the other day that they are going to be really moving on living wage. Um, yet to be seen if they do it, but it's, mm. I think, a bold move from a, a, a brand at that price point. Um, there's so much, um, you know, I'm based in the UK, but you have the part of the European Union. There's an amazing things happening at the EU level, and most recently in California with the um, Government Workers Collective right. Bill. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in the policy framework, but using all the policy frameworks that we have at our disposal to make living wage a reality has to happen. And mm. it's an opener to everything else, to female empowerment, um, educated women and empowered women, uh, you know, it, it, looping back around from social justice or sorry, equity is a better term now to climate change, you know, two of the top um, solutions in Project Drawdown. So the top top solutions to climate change um, involve women and girls, uh, education mm. of girls and um, uh, uh, assistance for women on their reproductive health and um, birth control. And all of that becomes much more unlocked when you have meaningful and well-paid employment. So I, my, my backing at the moment is on living wage. We've got to get there. There's a little mm. bit of a head of steam happening and we need to see that accelerate. Mm. That, that's really interesting. It, it makes so much sense as it being the lead domino that makes everything else easier. You know, if, if it, I mean, we, we've seen, and this has been reported on uh, um, for quite some time that poverty for one is, is expensive. Poverty for one is, is, uh, or in addition is unsustainable. Uh, and so that is such a, a clear, easy first path. That solution seems to be the easiest, at least to me, <laughs> um, looking from the outside in, uh, and, and most clear as so many of the, the concepts and definitions of sustainability and circularity are still a, a bit of a work in progress. Um, and as well, just reflecting on it right now, in my understanding of the, the fashion industry and, and tracking the news uh, and updates much more closely as of late, it seems to be a bit more of a blip a in the conversation as opposed yeah. to um, the, the more direct focus on the environmental impact. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. It wasn't, you couldn't get it on the agenda before. Mm. Just and again, I kind of I really applaud Apt and you know, our client PVH was the parent company of Tommy Hilfiger. You know, brands such as those joining, coming on to Apt and really giving it some energy. Um, but no, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't make it part of a sustainability strategy or even a business strategy before, mm. and that's starting to change. Yeah, and, and it. It was it was really refreshing to see what happened in in California and, and many mm -hmm. people in the sustainable fashion community obviously mm -hmm. celebrating that. Um, but even the news of that to me, I felt a little bit kind of late to the game. I'm like, wow, you know, I'm knowing about this um, as it's just sort of becoming up for vote, uh, as opposed to I mean, and that that's certainly something that many of the advocates in that space in in that state had been working on for a significant amount of time. So hopefully that that continues the momentum, and I imagine it will. There are some really good good people in this this space who are, are making sure that that will be the case. Um, and California yeah. is great for that. It's great for um, putting down legislation that then is proof of concept, and other jurisdictions can. Follow. You know, it wasn't the first with a um, regional greenhouse gas trading initiative, but it was one of the first, and it really yeah. paved the way for others, the EU, to take it up, etc. So, yeah, I, I've got high hopes. Right. Just, uh, I mean, outside of the direct impact, it can be at a minimum symbolic and momentum for right. you know what can happen in the U.S. context in other states. I know that yeah. New York is another, as far as our concentration of where garment workers are. New York is another yeah. state that, that would be of a focus. And if it can be passed in California, perhaps there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Lucy, I'm curious with, with your expertise, uh, as I know that there are so many small, mid-sized, very exciting and innovative brands in the space of sustainable fashion who've, who've taken some really 
uh, uh, unique initiatives on, uh, created some really compelling products and stories. What, what would you recommend for them to help uh, become perhaps a, a, a greater amplifier of their message, of the narrative? How, how might you recommend they punch above their weight, so to speak, if we are you know, waiting for or, or hopefully attempting to nudge the, the industry players who have the much greater scale? How can smaller brands and organizations perhaps yeah. uh, um, punch a little bit higher? I mean, uh, without wanting to sound unambitious, I'd also say just keep doing what they're doing. I realize I've spoken a lot about big brands and not so much about the kind of smaller players, but that's why the big brands <laughs> a lot of the time act. I mean, it's not the only reason, but you know, the kind of the um, the honest brands, the kind of the fast growth entrants, um, yeah. the ones that pioneer um, different use of materials or cutting or payment of their workers, whatever it may be, give a proof of concept, but also um, can be exceptionally good at messaging and exceptionally mm. good at branding. So rather than kind of sit here and give a, a, a lot of kind of tips on how to best brand or communicate or, you know, be an advocate, I'd actually say it's happening really well. Um, you know, whether it's on traceability and transibility, uh, uh, transparency, but, I mean, Reformation, Evelina, um, all words are, you know, always named, but there's others, um, oh, the New Zealand, uh, wool brand, which has the barcode and things like <laughs> that. And it's, it's, um, it's emblematic of where the industry is going. And not just in fashion, but in other sectors as well, in FMCG, a, a lot of the um, pressure for innovation and change comes from looking at the new entrance to the market mm. and comes from the new entrance, you know, starting to eat the big brand's lunch. So, <laughs> you know, hopefully we should be able to get to this, um, you know, really virtuous circle where innovation spurs innovation and we can get to a brilliant system. But I think I think the smaller brands are doing amazingly at that. Um, and I know it's it's tough out there. Mm. And as a smaller brand, you don't have control of your supply chain. Um, so it can be hard to make change across every single you know area or touch point. So I think continue doing what these brands often do, which is lean into a particular attribute um, or kind of point of brand interests, um, whether that be in, yeah, as I say, choice of material or um, social um, cause or, um, you know, circular model and uh, some take back. Um, so I, 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 would, I, could, I would rather applaud and say <laughs> keep going um, where they're going than necessarily do anything different. Mm. I, I love that sentiment. I, I I think it just comes, or perhaps that question comes from my. I almost feel a little bit angry or resentful when I feel like I found out about a very exciting and, and and cool and compelling brand, and then I think to myself, I'm like, why why haven't I known about them earlier? And then, as an evangelist myself, like that's kind of my attitude and approach. I'm like, well, I got to tell everyone else about them, you know, because no one else knows about them. Yeah. Okay. No, I get, okay. In which case I'm going to answer the question completely differently. From some of my kind of, my favorite top picks, if you like, um, <laughs> I love Lelesso. Lelesso is this kind of, Lelesso is this life that I don't have. It's kind of like a, a beach wear <laughs> cruise <laughs> thing. And amazing stories, amazing materials, just look and feel like great. Um, I love D Sphere and the amazing um, mm. platform and storytelling that does, and just you can just buy kind of two things. I love that. Um, I I personally, because like anyone, we've had a everyone even we've had a whole move outside, mm. um, and you know more swimming and more being active. I've got really into Finisterre, um, UK brand on the on Cornwall coast, I think. Um, and they kind of have their um, dry robes if you can get changed <laughs> outside and just really great trousers, which I now wear the whole time. <laughs> and, um, I'd also point to um, 
Common Objective, or CO as they're called. So it's headed up by a woman called Tamsin Lejean. Um, full disclosure, uh, I used to be on the board, I, I'm not anymore, but that's what they do. They're kind of a, a marketplace and they match the individual, the consumer to, and that's how I found out about the Lesso, actually. I said to Tamsin, I need to get a really good dress for a wedding and I don't actually have anything in my wardrobe that is going to do. And I've been special, I haven't found the right thing. She said, try the Lesso. She, she was right. Um, <laughs> so the, the platform is like, to me, it's like Tamsin, but on a digital scale. <laughs> so the idea is that as an individual, you can go on and find amazing brands, but also working in the industry, if you're looking for a specific material or a supplier or um, um, a brand to sell to, it's designed to match make as well. So have, mm. I would say, take a, take a look at that if you haven't already. Mm. Lovely recommendations. And, and Lucy, so those are some bright spots that we're talking about in, in fashion right there. And we've covered others in different bits and spurts in this conversation already. I, I'm wondering maybe more so directly, what, what has you most hopeful and perhaps inspired and optimistic for the future of, of fashion and, and sustainable fashion particularly? Um, I, well, the way that... So I'll, I'll go, I'll rewind a little bit and go back to when we coined the term swishing, uh, which was, oh my goodness, um, back in, I mean, I think 2008 or nine. And at the time, you know, cloud swaps existed. They definitely existed. They did not yeah. exist online. And there was no Depop or, you know, thread up or any of that lot. Um, and they would definitely seem to be a green and low status thing to do. So that's why we kind of gave it the name, made a little website, um, did a couple of parties with, you know, some journalists from Vogue and Tatler and others, and just saw this whole thing boom, take off. And, you know, we never made any money from it. We didn't try to, we never put a business model around it. <laughs> Um, did it because we liked it, it's really <laughs> kind of a way of showing that uh, more sustainable can be better. Um, mm. You know, substitution, not sacrifice. Uh, as a friend of mine who runs a sustainability agency over in Australia, um, work of everyone, um, Ben calls it uh, the law of more, that actually you can get mm. more from a sustainable choice, that at a social party you can get free clothes, but also have a party and meet people <laughs> and come away with something you'd never get in the shops and get people to advise you on, oh, this thing would look great on you. So the whole kind of, you know, social currency and, um, you know, make it fun if you want it done, um, we always say. So, and now swishing almost seems really old hat and a little bit dated <laughs> now. I, I mean, I still swish, don't worry. I'm not saying if you're doing swishing, oh, how terribly old school. But it's, it's really in some ways not needed anymore because of Depop, ThreadUp, um, mm. big brands coming on board. So I'm not, of course we're not there. We're not there in terms of a circular system, but the way that in uh, less than a decade, something like swishing was needed in order to popularize second hands basically, yeah. um, and get rid of some of those chips and shoulders that people have about, oh, you know, it's, it's not for me. Um, that gives me hope. And um, solutions. I feel in sustainable fashion and more widely in the run up to COP, um, we're seeing uh, more and more the idea that we need to help and persuade folks to be more sustainable, to be kind of coming down. Mm. And the idea that we just need to get on and do it and provide the solutions and people will use them and people will come and people will buy them. I see that starting to take hold a little bit more. So that gives me hope. We can't even see what all the solutions need to be yet, but that gives me hope. Mm. Yeah. It, it seems as if there's uh, it's a more of a supply issue than, than right. it's a demand. It's yeah. often and my wife and I have these conversations on a daily basis from whatever it is that we're doing, whatever the activity might be, there's always like, Oh, I wish there was this, you know, right. from something that would hopefully, you know, mitigate or, or lower our own personal impact. And when we come across the solution that, that we were desiring, we're like, Oh, 
that feeling of, I wish I had it sooner. Uh, and it, it, it's, that is, I like looking at it from that way. Cause it can sometimes be very easy to go down more of a cynical path, uh, uh in that light. Um, well, Lucy, I, I, oh, I, go ahead. I've got a, I've just, there was one more thing I've just got to tell you, which is, um, <laughs> Futura, the change agency is actually changing, um, to, do that actually we've got Futera mm. makes launching so our first product in that kind of if only there was we've got <laughs> a partnership with our client Mars to bring to market an uh, insect based cat food so first first in the UK um, mm. insect cat food I think is it first globally so, uh, one of the first insect cat foods are called love bug so the idea being, you know, cats eat insects anyway. Let's give them some of those <laughs> cat food, and there'll be more of those. And the other thing that we're doing is um, setting up our not-for-profit uh, to lean into culture change mm-hmm. and actually creating solutions for people to see themselves more at the heart of climate action and climate change and equity and all these things. So, yeah, um, solutions. We need more of those. Mm, we certainly do. Lucy, uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time. Uh, I want to be respectful of it. But before we wrap up, you mind if I hit you with a, a couple rapid fire questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, go. All right. So first, uh, what what's maybe a book, film, or, or any resource really that if someone was interested in diving deeper into the topics we discussed today, what, what might you recommend uh, that they they check out or dive into? Um, for sustainable fashion, uh, an author who I think is really good is Kate Fletcher. She's, she's got a few pieces out. Um, uh, more widely, uh, I read, it's available online, and there's a kind of a coffee table book, the uh, Project Drawdown and the Top mm. 100 Solutions to Climate Change. It always cheers you up. <laughs> um, and I feel there's another. Well, that's it for the moment. Have you uh, picked up uh, Paul Hawkins' new book, Regeneration, by chance? I haven't yet. Did you, is it mm. good? I'm working through it right now. I'll actually be speaking to him <laughs> on the podcast here in about a month. So. That's brilliant. Oh, hang on. What am I talking about? Also, another recommendation is uh, The Happy Hero by my colleague, uh, mm. Solitaire Townsend, and also Green Giants by my other colleague, um, Freya Williams. Mm, lovely recommendations. Uh, next one for you. Is there any particular daily habit or morning routine that you feel like you have to stick to? <laughs> I'm just laughing because I've got two young kids. And <laughs> <laughs> the constant battle we have. Can you sit on? Mornings are not my happiest place at the moment. It's chaos. Um, but I, well, I'll tell you what I have, uh, I've taken up and I hope to keep going is um, swimming outside at the Lido in a way, mm. of, like bringing myself back down after the whole. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's not, are you going to keep it going into winter? Planning to. Really? I've got my wow. neoprene hat so far. Okay. I've ordered the um, you know, little booties and gloves. I don't think I'll last all winter through. I'm just going to try and keep going as long as I can. Wow. Awesome. Well, uh, last one for you, Lucy. Uh, our listeners here are social entrepreneurs and, and change makers uh, all over the world from all different sectors. Uh, I'm curious, what's one piece of advice that you could leave our listeners with? Uh, everything's going to be okay. <laughs> Stay positive um, and keep going. Like it's, we are going to make it and find solutions. Mm. And you know, look for them, work on them, tell everyone about them. Mm. Lovely advice for us to end on, Lucy. Lastly, where should we keep up with you? Where should we go uh, uh, to keep up with all the new things we have going on at, at Futera? So our website and our LinkedIn and our socials that we are Futera.com and Futera on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram. And then I am also on LinkedIn, a um, bit different on Twitter at the moment. So yeah, LinkedIn <laughs> and Instagram are the best. Perfect. We'll have uh, all those things linked up in the show post at growensemble.com. Thank you so much again, Lucy. 
Oh, thank you, Corey. Great questions. Thank you so much.